Thank you, Laura, for that generous introduction. I was reminded of what the great baseball player, Dizzy Dean, once said after he received a, an introduction like that. He said, you know, the older I get, the greater I was. <laughs> <laughs> I am delighted to be speaking at one of the premier gatherings of conservatives in the nation. I got my conservatism honestly. I was born and raised in Cincinnati, and the great literary giant, Mark Twain, once said after his 10th visit to Cincinnati on a train ride out going to Louisville, young guy from the Louisville Corridor, a journalist, asked him what his impression was of the queen city of the Midwest, Cincinnati. He said, son, if I heard the world was ending tomorrow, I would get to Cincinnati as fast as I could because things happened there 10 years after it happened in the rest of the world. <laughs> My grandmother, when she sent me off to college after a family gathering, she reminded me that I had been raised on three books and that although I was going to a great university, Xavier University, with a very, very full library, that those three books should guide me in my pursuit of life endeavors. Those three books simply were my date book, my checkbook, and the good book. She said, your date book will tell how you spend your time and with whom you spend it. And so again, I am glad to be spending this Sunday with you. She said, your checkbook, no matter how abundant or meager, will in fact reflect your priorities. And so I am good and glad and delighted to be with you and many others who give constantly, not only to their church, but to causes that really do promote those things that have made us the greatest democracy in all of human history. The good book, she said, will help you choose the path of conviction over the path of convenience. And ladies and gentlemen, at a time when we see relativism on the march and we see political forces that are trying to run God and faith out of the public square, there is a question that is asked in Psalms 11, in that good book, that was a question that was always put my brothers and my cousins and I. And that question is simply this. If the foundation be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? And on this Sunday morning, it is a profound question that each and every one of us should be prepared to answer. And I think your attendance at this gathering is so important is because you have said that you will not reside on the sidelines, but you will fight this battle on the front line. You see, President Trump's Make America Great Again is more than a slogan. It is a program. It is an agenda that will put us back on the path of liberty and adherence to God's word. If you stop and think about the Declaration of Independence, which is the border around the Constitution of the United States, it is the framework in which the Constitution sits. In that second paragraph, it is stated that we hold these truths to be self-evident, 
Now, let me just tell you, my dad, who was a meat packer, used to say that's a highfalutin way of saying any idiot should get this. <laughs> we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. We're not all the same in terms of ethnicity and race and height and worldview. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, which mean our most fundamental human rights are not grants from government. They are gifts from God. And there is not a government on the face of the earth that can give you those rights. Governments can only protect your God-given rights and liberties. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, in that particular order. It is very difficult to enjoy liberty if your life is snuffed out. So we have become defenders of innocent life of all types, all human types of human life, from the unborn to the elderly. It is very difficult to pursue happiness if you're not free. And so conservatives, constitutional conservatives across this country have understood something that was put in philosophical and, ac and academic terms by Aristotle. Aristotle said that there was a constant tension between individual liberty and the concentrated power of government. When, in fact, government assumes too much power, it snuffs out individual liberty. So our Constitution is a harness on the growth and reach and power of government. And those radicals on the left work both politically and in our courts to unharness the reach and power of government and they do so with those of us who cherish individual liberty paying the price. And so we cannot sit on the sidelines. We have to push the refresh button and, get, and stay in the game. And if we took an intermission to get back in the game, because they are determined to make sure that the agenda that puts us back on the path of greatness is in fact contained and crushed. You cannot deal with the radical left with strategic patience. You cannot deal with them by accepting in moderation their agenda. We must be committed to understanding that there is a reason why we are the most affluent, the most free nation on the face of the earth. And that's because we fundamentally understand that free men and free women in free markets with God's guidance can do just about anything under the sun. But they have advanced, particularly in an accelerated way, in the last nine years, an agenda that is not just an economic and political agenda, but an agenda that is actually a cultural agenda. And just think about it. We have rapidly become a culture where earning money doesn't entitle you to it, but wanting money does. 
Think about that. We are people who understand that capitalism and free markets actually fuel growth and opportunities for the expression of human innovation and the advancement of a people and a culture economically and politically and culturally. But there on the left is a fundamental dislike for free markets, a lack of understanding and a hate for capital. Those of us who love freedom understand that capital seeks the path of least resistance and greatest opportunity. And that's why President Trump's agenda to get the tri $2 trillion off our shores that are just sitting there because we have a convoluted tax system and because we have developed a government that believes that that is their money and not the producers of those capitals and those products money, we now have a situation where if we don't fix our tax code, we cannot sustain the sort of growth and job creation that we need. When President Trump took over, the labor participation rate was at at least a 50-year low. When he took over, we were witnessing anemic growth and a sluggish stock market. But he, in fact, interjected optimism. And now it is our time, since conservatives and Republicans control the House of Representatives, the Senate, the White House, and we are now approaching a constitution-loving majority on the Supreme Court, we, in fact, must make sure that we finish the job by passing a legislative package that puts infrastructure under the president's aspirations and promises. Just in his short tenure, we've seen the creation of 800,000 new jobs. We, we've, 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 we've seen capital start to change its directions from flowing outside in our shores and sitting on the fence to coming back. This is because he has done what he said he would do with over 43 executive orders, many of them geared towards creating a regulatory environment that is sensible and not filled with red tape that is just in, that is inviting to capital coming back, but more importantly, to putting the American worker to, get, to work again with meaningful and, 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 and healthy incomes. Ladies and gentlemen, what he understood was that we are at our best when we understand that there is not a war like the left would like to have you believe between capital and workers. When capital is working, workers are working. And when workers are working, we are producing. And when we are producing, we, in fact, cement our position as the most robust economic force in the world. That's what we have to do right now in the arena. No more timeouts, no more retreats, no more trying to appease the left and their big government agenda. We want to um, underscore that free men and free women can get the job done. I had an uncle, his name was D. Hart Hubbard. Most of you probably have never heard of him. He was the first black American to win an Olympic gold medal in track and field. He did it. He did it in the 1924 Olympic Games in Paris. That year, he had qualified for three events. 
the long jump, the high hurdles, and the 100-yard dash. There was a transatlantic debate between the great Eric Little and my uncle as to who was the fastest human being on the face of the earth, and they were going to resolve it in Paris. When my uncle got to Paris, he was told by the International, International Olympic Committee that he could compete only in one event, and that was the long jump. The high hurdles and the 100-yard dash were deemed white-only events. As we all know, Eric Little didn't get to run in the 100 that year. My uncle set the world record in the long jump. But what happened when he came back, he told my mom's generation, he said God had blessed him by letting him witness what he called one of the most profound expressions of fidelity to faith by Eric Little. As you know, Eric Little didn't run in the finals because the finals fell on the Sabbath. And he was so true to his faith that he gave up the chance to set the world record and to be the fastest human pe person on the face of the earth because of his fidelity to his faith in God's word. My uncle in 1925 established the record in the hundred. But he said that there was no better gift that God had given him than for him to witness Eric's fidelity to his faith. And on this Sunday morning, On this Sunday morning, I say to you that we must be true. We must show the same sort of fidelity to those principles, to those aspects of our worldview that has made us a free people, a creative people, a prosperous people, worthy of being the beacon on the hill. And because I'm speaking to you on the Sabbath, let me close out with these two things. John 3, there's a verse that says, those who would do evil love the darkness. We're told elsewhere in the Bible that we're not to put, in Luke, we're not to put our, our light under a bushel. We're to put it on a candlestick and raise it high. And my grandmother would have smacked me upside the back of the head and said, that was Matthew, son. Uh, we're told that we, we, we don't put it under a bushel, but on a stick and raise it high because it, in fact, represents our celebration of the magnificence of our God. That same grandmother of mine who worked for a university professor as a housekeeper gave me a book, a novel, one year when I had the mumps to read. And it was about a story in the early 1900s of a little boy who was in an infirmary. Uh, and he was one night at his window and a nurse came in, and she asked him, it was at dusk, and she asked him, little boy, what are you doing? She said, I'm watching the man punch holes in the darkness. She said, what? He said, I'm watching the man punch holes in the darkness. So she went to the window, and what this little boy was watching was the lamplighter go down the street lighting the lamps. And in his mind's eye, the man was punching holes in the darkness. Ladies and gentlemen, fellow Christians and conservatives and believers and our wonderful God, our obligation at this time, when those on the left and elsewhere, both domestically and foreign, would want to intimidate us 
with the darkness of our time. Let us raise our candles together, rush the darkness, and punch holes in the darkness. God bless you.